Hi, everyone. Welcome back to chapter 10. This is section four. This is the last section of the semester. So these are the same announcements you've seen. Make sure you're finishing up all my style lab assignments, both current assignments and past assignments. Also, I highly recommend working on the practice exams. They're extra credit and really good practice for studying for exam five, as well as the cumulative final exam. These same notes for your final exam, you can use your notes, the textbook, the tables, Excel, a calculator. It's going to be cumulative and also keep this policy in mind. So with this policy, your final exam can actually be worth up to 35% of your final grade. So really take it seriously and really prepare for that coming up. So we're continuing chapter 10 now on correlation and regression. Before we jump into 10.4, I want to review two quick things from 10.1 and 10.2. The first thing I want to review here is how to add additional numbers past the decimal place within your regression line equation. For instance, you will need this if you're asked for more than three or four decimal places within your slope and your y-intercept. So to increase the number of decimal places here, you want to be clicked onto your graph and clicked onto this text box that has your regression line equation. Once you're clicked onto that text box, you're going to go to Format Trendline Options. That should appear. Then you're going to go to Under Label Options. Click on the icon that looks like a bar chart here. Then under this number option, you want to change your category to be number rather than general. When this category is number, you can change the number of decimal places here to five, six, whatever number you'd like. So that was the first point I wanted to review before going into 10.4. The next one is here. So as was mentioned previously, you can use this function in Excel to find your p-value from a t-test statistic. However, you may have noticed if you have a negative value for your t-test statistic, you'll get an error when you use this function in Excel. To get around that error, you want to take the absolute value of your negative t-test statistic, then use that positive form of the number to find your p-value. You can take the absolute value of your t-test statistic just in a different cell in Excel, and then use that number to find your p-value. You could also set up the function in Excel so the absolute value of the t value is taken within this t distribution function. What that would look like is we have our t test statistic, it's negative. For our p value calculation, we want to take the absolute value of that negative t test statistic. Be careful doing this here because you still want to use the unrounded form of your t test statistic when finding your p value. To use the unrounded form, you want to click on the cell that contains your t-test statistic rather than just typing in 0.83, for example. Because within the 0.83, we know we really have a few more decimal places that go on beyond that number three. Then I'd click enter with my negative t-test statistic now. I can get a p-value because I first took the absolute value of my t-test statistic. The other number that goes into this function will not change. That's still your number of degrees of freedom. Another important point here is that your degrees of freedom is still n minus 2 here in chapter 10. So those are the two points I wanted to review. Now we are going into 10.4 now. So 10.4 is on multiple regression, and let's go through some key concepts of 10.4. So as the name implies with multiple regression, this section provides methods for analyzing a linear relationship when we have more than two variables. Within multiple regression, we'll focus on how do we find the multiple regression equation. Then also within 10.4, we're introducing this concept of an adjusted R-squared value. This adjusted R-squared value, along with the p-value from your multiple regression analysis, will give us a measure of how well the multiple regression equation fits the sample data. 
Then beyond these points, we'll also look at the interpretation of results from Excel. Surprise, surprise, we're using Excel again. Not only will we use Excel here, but you actually have to use some sort of technology because these equations get pretty complex. Let's look at those equations now. So for a multiple regression equation, remember we have more than two variables here. This multiple regression equation still expresses a linear relationship between a response variable, which is y, and two or more predictor variables, which are x. These two or more predictor variables are labeled as x subscript one, x subscript two, and so on through x subscript k, where k can be any positive integer. In the context of our class, we'll have x subscript one, x subscript two, all the way up through maybe x subscript four, and we won't really go beyond that. So as mentioned, this multiple regression equation gets a little bit more complex. So let's look at that now. The general form for this multiple regression equation, we still have y hat, our predictor variable y, is equal to then b naught plus b1 times x1 plus b2 now times x2 and so on for all of our predictor variables of x1, x2, all the way through x subscript k. So now here within this multiple regression equation, this y hat we'll call our response variable. Then those predictor variables again are x subscript one, x subscript two, all the way through x subscript k. So now a little bit more on finding a multiple regression equation, let's talk about the objective here. In using this multiple regression equation, we still ultimately want to predict y or y hat. The reason we would need a multiple regression equation is only if we have three or more variables that we're working with. Where those three variables would be y hat, x1, and x2. So we need at least three variables at minimum in order to even need a multiple regression equation. Let's look at the notation next. So we saw this general format for a multiple regression equation. This format that we looked at is for sample data, right? And we recognize that because we have y hat and we have lowercase b's here in our equation. So that was for sample data. Now a multiple regression equation for population data still looks pretty similar, but notice we have y here instead of y hat, and we have beta here instead of b. Then pertaining to our sample data multiple regression equation, this y hat is still the same as what we've seen before, where y hat is the predicted value of y. The meaning of this k notation here is the number of predictor variables, also called independent variables or x variables. Remember, k can go all the way up through any positive integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. In this class, we'll usually work with a k value up to about 4. You'll see later, though, that we want to use as few variables as possible to still get significant data. So we'll end up using one or two independent variables rather than as many variables as we possibly can. Then the last piece of notation here is n, so that's our sample size. Now for some requirements in finding a multiple regression equation. This first one isn't necessarily a requirement, but it's something to keep in mind. So for any specific set of x values, the regression equation is associated with a random error that we call epsilon. As we've seen with statistics, we know that every data set comes with at least some amount of error. There is definitely no perfect data set. Within this error, though, for a multiple regression equation, what we can do is assume that such errors are normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of sigma, and that the random errors are independent. 
This meaning of independent here means we have some error for some pair of data, but then that error does not impact the error in the rest of the data. Next, going through the procedure for finding that multiple regression equation, we are going to use Excel here because it gets complex. In 10.4, we'll go through step by step how to set up that multiple regression analysis and then how to use that analysis to get your multiple regression equation. Excel will do all of the heavy lifting for us, but we have to know how to interpret the data that we get. Let's jump in now to this example of predicting weight. So from data set number one on um, body data, that's in appendix B of your textbook, you can also find this data set online through the ebook. So this data set one includes heights, waist circumferences, weights from a sample of 153 males. What we're going to do is find the multiple regression equation in which the response variable Y is the weight of a male and the predictor variables of x1 is height, x2 is waist circumference. How do we know we need a multiple regression equation here? Well, we have three variables, right? We have y and at least two x variables. y, again, is our weight, x1 is the height, waist circumference is x2. Designating height as x1 and the waist circumference as x2 was arbitrary. We could have also assigned them as the other way around. What we do need to know for certain is what is our response variable, what is y? And here we're told that y will be the weight of a male. So let's start to solve this now. The first thing we need to do is get that data set and put it into Excel. Here we're working with data set number one, and we only want to consider the first 153 data points. As a reminder on how to get a data set and put that into Excel, you've done that in your past Excel assignments, so be sure to go back to that if you need assistance with getting your data from the ebook into Excel. So once I have my data into Excel, it looks like this. I went through and highlighted that I want my Y value to be the weight, so I highlighted this column. I also know that our two predictor variables are the height and the waist, so I went ahead and highlighted those as well. This just makes it easier for me to visualize because I know I don't need this data over here or these columns over here. Then, as mentioned, we only want 153 data points to work with. To make this easier on myself, I went ahead and went down to row 154, and I deleted all the data that was below that row. Why did I go to row 154 rather than 153? Well, remember that your text headers are in row one. So to actually get 153 samples of data, we need to go through 154. So again, I went to this row 154 and I deleted all the data that was below that. Now, one thing I also want you to keep in mind is that depending on which 153 data entries you selected, we'll get a slightly different version for our multiple regression equation. To make it easy on us, we're just gonna work with the first 153 data entries. Again, all that was specified in the question though is that we want 153 data entries. Here, we're just picking the first. We could have also randomly selected 153 different data entries from the total data set. Next, let's set up our multiple regression analysis using Excel. So to do this, first you wanna to go to your data tab, go to data analysis, that's an add-in that you needed, Go to regression, click OK. What this looks like is I go under my data tab, I go to that data analysis button, this populates, I click on regression, then I select OK. Now, once the regression window pops up, I want to input my Y and my X data ranges. When selecting your data ranges, you do want to include the top row that has those text headers. 
To select this data, you can either drag and select or type in the data range that you want. Typing in the data range into Excel, though, can get a little bit tricky because you do have to use dollar signs in your data. So we select our X and our Y data, then we check off labels, which indicates that we're using the text headers as part of our data set. So remember when you include the top row of text headers, you have to check off labels or else you'll get an error. The next thing to do here is to look at your output range. You can have your output analysis go onto a new worksheet or select a cell that you want Excel to provide that analysis on. Let me show you what this all looks like in Excel. Here's my regression window that pops up. My Y data was in column K and we wanted to select from row one all the way down through 154. Then my X data is in columns L and M, and again, it goes through 1 through 54 as far as the rows. Then I mentioned you need to check off labels here, so make sure you check that off. That indicates you're using your text headers as part of this Y and X range. Then for the output range, you can have it go onto a new worksheet or you can have it go onto that same worksheet, just indicate what cell you want Excel to display your analysis on. And again, I prefer to drag and select my data, but you could type this in. You just have to be really careful to include these dollar signs here. To be safe, I recommend highlighting and dragging to select your Y range and your X range. When you're ready to click OK, you'll get a table that looks like this. There's a lot going on here in the summary output, but I'll talk you through what each point we care about for our analysis. The first thing we want to pay attention to is our R squared value and our adjusted R squared value. You will find those two points here in your summary output. The next thing to pay attention to is your p-value. We see that here, and with an exponent of negative 68, we know that's a very, very small number. When our p-value is really small, we just go ahead and call that essentially zero. You can think of this p-value as your overall significance of multiple regression equation. Then maybe the most important thing we get from the summary output is how to actually make your multiple regression equation. So once we get these numbers here and our coefficients, then we want to start plugging those into our general format for our multiple regression equation. To set that up, you always want to say y hat is equal then to this number here, which we get from this intercept coefficient. Notice we only have three significant figures for all of these coefficients here. We don't put an X here. This is just our intercept coefficient. Then we say plus this next number here, then X1. Because we included those text headers in our data ranges, that's the benefit here because now we know X1 height refers to this part here in our formula. Then also in our regression equation, we need this coefficient here for our x2, so we put that into this part of our equation. So again, no x value here for our intercept coefficient. Then for x1, we use this coefficient. For x2, we use this next coefficient. And we use three sig figs per coefficient. And also we have y hat here. This is technically y hat not just plain y. So something we did previously in chapter 10 as well is we can take this regression equation and plug in the meaning for y hat as well as x1 and now x2. So here's that multiple regression equation that we got using the analysis from Excel. We still had to construct this multiple regression equation ourselves, but Excel gave us everything we needed to do so. Then it is nice to go ahead and plug in the meaning for y hat and each of our x variables. It makes it easier to keep track of what's what. So for our example here, we know y hat refers to the weight 
X1 refers to the height and X2 refers to the waist. Again, this format is fine. This format is a little bit easier to use and understand when we're actually going to then make predictions for our weight value. Next, let's talk a little bit more about that adjusted coefficient or R squared value. This R squared value or the adjusted coefficient of determination is the multiple coefficient of determination R squared that we've seen before now modified to account for the number of variables and the sample size. Using that multiple regression analysis option in Excel, you can go ahead and get an adjusted R squared value. If you had to manually calculate your adjusted R squared value, you could do that as well. The equation for that is your adjusted R squared value is equal to one minus all of these factors here. Notice it's complex because we have both R squared, R unknown on this side of the equation, as well as on this side of the equation. So you could solve for R squared, it would get a little bit more complicated. I recommend using Excel instead of doing this manually. For those variables here, recall that N we know is our sample size and K is the number of predictor variables. So again, you could solve for adjusted R squared. You can also have Excel do it for you. Now, something that gets more interesting here in 10.4 is guidelines for finding the best multiple regression equation. Usually we'll have options for getting more than one different multiple regression equation. So let's talk through these guidelines now. Guideline number one is to use common sense and practical consideration to either include or exclude certain variables. Guideline number two, consider the p-value. Remember this gives us an overall idea of the significance of our data. Guideline number three in determining what is the best multiple regression equation option from our given set of data is to consider equations with high values of adjusted R squared and try to include only a few variables if you can. Some quick notes on the interpretation of our adjusted R squared value. And we'll talk more about this on the next slide as well. The adjusted R squared value only increases when the new term improves the model fit. On the other hand, then, our adjusted R squared value actually decreases when the term does not improve the model by a sufficient amount. Essentially, if we can use three predictor variables instead of four or two predictor variables instead of three, we should do so. So it decreases the complexity of our multiple regression equation. But at the same time, it won't take away from the accuracy of our predicted y hat value. So now more on this. So instead of including almost every available variable, we're going to try to include relatively few predictor x variables as possible. How will we know then if we should use four predictor variables or three, for example? One way is if an additional predictor variable is included, the value of the adjusted R squared does not increase very much. We'll look at an example of this as well in comparing when should we use two predictor variables or just three or maybe even just one. So when we have multiple options of using two, three, four different predictor variables, for a particular number of predictor x variables, select the equation with the largest value of the adjusted r squared. We still have to think critically here, and that will be in the example that we do a little bit later. In other words, we shouldn't just blindly use as many predictor variables as are available. Then one last guideline here. So in excluding predictor X variables that don't have much of an effect on the response Y variable, it actually might be helpful to find the linear correlation coefficient R like we've done before for each pair of variables being considered. Then if two of those predictor variables have a very high linear correlation coefficient, so that'd be close to positive one or really close to negative one, 
This is called multicollinearity. If this is the case, then there is no need to include both of those predictor variables. Instead, we should exclude the variable with the lower value of the adjusted R squared. Let's talk about this analysis then and how do we really decide which predictor variables to use and how many. To do that, let's look at this example now. So predicting height from footprint evidence. In data set number two in your textbook, that's in appendix B, we have data for age, foot length, shoe print length, shoe size, and height for 40 different subjects. That's a lot of variables here. So how many do we use? Which ones do we use? Ultimately, we need to decide those questions because we're going to use that sample data, find the regression equation that is the best for predicting height. We'll talk about what that best means. Then is the best regression equation a good equation for actually predicting height? We'll talk about that as well. So for our solution and for all those different options for predictor values, there are actually 15 different possible combinations of predictor variables amongst all these options. On the next slide, we'll look at a table that includes key results from just five of those different combinations. The first combination then is a predictor variable of age. Here's our adjusted R squared value. It looks pretty low. Here's our p-value of 0 0.004. The next combination is using foot length. There we have a greater adjusted R-squared value, which is good, along with a smaller p-value, which is also good. So you can see we're looking for a high adjusted R-squared value, but a low p-value. Next, shoe print length, we get this adjusted R squared value and still a very small P value. The fourth combination here is foot length and shoe print length with this adjusted R squared value and this P value. Then the fifth combination we'll look at is combining age, foot length, shoe print length, and shoe size. It gives us this adjusted R squared value and still a very small P value. So with these different combinations, using both the p-value and the adjusted r-squared value, we can then talk about what's the best combination of predictor values. Keep in mind our response variable is height, and we're still looking for actual solid evidence using footprints from a crime scene, for example. Now, with all these numbers in mind, let's talk about what different combinations we can use, which should we use to get the best multiple regression equation for this set of data. And not only for this set of data, but specifically to predict height from this set of data. So now with maybe some thoughtless application of those multiple regression equation combinations, we may think that the best regression equation uses all four predictor variables. Why do we think that? Well, it would make sense because this is the highest adjusted R squared value and we still do have a very low P value. But as I've mentioned, we don't want to use just as many variables as we can. We want to think critically and try to use as few as we can to still get good results for our predictor Y value. So using all four, we could do, but it's probably not the best, probably not the most efficient. So let's keep in mind the main objective of the question. So we want to use evidence to estimate the height of a suspect. So let's continue critically thinking about this and then ultimately decide what are the best predictor variables to use. So going through those different categories, actually using a variable of age doesn't really make much sense in this context of footprint evidence. Why is that thinking practically? Well, here criminals rarely leave evidence of how old they are at a crime scene. There could be some evidence of this if we actually collected a DNA sample and analyzed that DNA, but for now we're going to just think that age probably isn't a good predictor variable to use. 
Then one predictor variable we didn't even see in those possible five combinations is the shoe size. Shoe size is basically the same thing as thinking about our foot length. So we're also going to then exclude shoe size from a possible predictor variable. Then we'll keep going on to this next slide here to then ultimately keep critically thinking about which predictor variables we should use. So then now between foot length and shoe print length, we're going to only use foot length because it's adjusted R squared value of 0 0.7014 is greater than the other adjusted R squared value. So in comparing just foot length and shoe print length now, out of those two, we should go with foot length because it has a larger adjusted R squared value. So now using process of elimination, we know we want to use foot length over shoe print length. So what about then comparing just foot length with an adjusted R squared value of 0 0.7014 to then the combination of using both foot length and shoe print length. Well, in looking at the adjusted R squared values, this one for both is not that much greater than if we just used foot length. And if we do have the option, we should use one predictor variable instead of two predictor variables if we can. This helps us decrease the complexity of the multiple regression equation, and it should still definitely get us a substantial, meaningful result. If we can't get a substantial, meaningful result just using one variable, then definitely we should use more than one. Then continuing and critically thinking about this specific example, although it appears that the use of a single variable of foot length is best, we also note that criminals actually usually wear shoes, so shoe print lengths are more likely to be found than foot lengths. Again, we're focused on the statistics here, but it is really good to think critically about what example we're working with. Well, what should we do then? What should we ultimately calculate using that multiple regression setup in Excel? Well, as we've been talking about, we have other practical considerations that suggest that it's best to use just a single predictor variable of foot length. So let's go with that one now and let's practice making the best regression equation using just height and foot length. The setup here is the same. So when you go to that data, data analysis, click on regression and you get this regression box. How I set up this regression input is I have my Y range starting at my text header one, going then to 40 data entries. My X range then is just foot length right now. So I just highlight and drag and select that column. It is important that you don't just select the entire column, but you select the data range that actually contains quantitative data. That means we want to go from row one through row 41, but don't include just the blank rows that are in that column. Then because we want to include the text headers because it helps us see that analysis output better, we want to check off labels here. Output range, I'll go ahead and put into just another cell on this same workbook. When I click OK here, I get this set of summary output data. In using the summary output data, I can make a multiple regression equation. I know it should be y hat is equal to this intercept coefficient with no x next to it, right? Then plus this coefficient for foot length, then x1. From this, we know we can also get our r squared value and our adjusted r squared value, as well as our p value from the significance number here. To make this a little bit easier on us then, if we can plug in what is the meaning of y and what is the meaning of x1. So here really we have height is equal to 64.1 plus 4.29 now times foot length because foot length is our x subscript 1. So now just to get a little bit more practice, we will say, however, Given that criminals usually do wear shoes, it's best to actually use the single predictor variable of shoe print length. 
Why are we going to do that? Well, it's mostly just to get more practice with making those multiple regression equations. So hopefully you're following along with me here and doing this in Excel. Here I have my height and now my shoe print length. So I set this up on just another portion of my workbook. Here I have my Y range, I have my X range. Again, I'm including row one because I'm including those text headers and I also check off labels here. This output range then is again, just another cell that's on my Excel workbook. When I click enter here, I get this table. We know what to do now, right? So we're gonna take this coefficient as our intercept coefficient, then this shoe print coefficient goes here. That makes our multiple regression equation of y hat is equal to 80.9 plus 3.22 times x1. Again, notice we have only three sig figs for both of these coefficients here. Making this a little bit easier to interpret then, we know we can plug in what's the meaning of y hat as well as x. That gives us then height is equal to 80.9 plus 3.22 times now shoe print length. As mentioned, it is good to look at the significance value here. This is also very, very small with that exponent of negative 10. From this very small number, we can essentially say our p-value is about zero. With this p-value of about zero, we can say that this regression equation yields a good model for estimating height. The other factor in that decision is that our adjusted r-square value is pretty high in the range of different options we could have used. And again, remember we want to use as few variables as possible to still get a meaningful result in the end. Now, the next topic here is on dummy variables. To define a dummy variable is a variable having only the values of zero and one that are used to represent the two different categories of a qualitative variable. Remember from our earlier discussion in this course on qualitative versus quantitative data. Quantitative data, we have numbers and values. Qualitative data, we have categories like color, hair color, things like that. A dummy variable is also sometimes called a dichotomous variable where the meaning of dichotomy is partitioning of a whole into two parts. Why do we call this a dichotomous variable then? Well, we're partitioning a whole into zero and one. So that's two different parts. We'll also do an example of finding the multiple regression equation when we're using dummy variables. If you're wondering why it's called a dummy variable, well, it's because the variable does not actually have any quantitative value but we're using quantitative values to represent qualitative categories, right? So we're using zero and one here to represent binary gender assignments. Other examples of qualitative data would be hair color. So you could also do something like redheads are zero and brunettes are one. So again, non-quantitative data here that we're then assigning a dummy variable that is quantitative, so zero and one. For instance, then let's look at this example using dummy variables. I do want to mention here that the book uses this binary definition of gender. So a male being a certain number and a female being a certain number. I'm giving that caveat here just as a heads up. So let's look at this data that we see in the textbook. We have a table that's data set five from your textbook. It's on family heights. Again, you can find that in Appendix B. So again, there is this binary assignment of gender here in this particular set of data. What we see from that is we're assigning a male as the number one, a female as the number zero. We're using this example data here to touch on dummy variables. So let's keep going through this example. As mentioned, for the assigned gender of a female, that's indicated by zero, the assigned gender of a male, that's indicated by the number one. 
Now our question is, given that a father is 69 inches tall, a mother is 63 inches tall, find the multiple regression equation and use it to predict the height of A, a daughter, and B, a son. Let's start solving this now. The first thing we need to do is put that data set into Excel. Next, we'll assign these variables. So Y, our response variable, then our different predictor variables. What this looks like in Excel is I have my Y data, my response data. What I have then here is X1 as the height of the father, X2 is the height of the mother, then X3 is the assigned gender of the child. In making this setup easier and how you do the multiple regression analysis, you want all of these columns to be together. So to do this, go ahead and copy and paste these three columns to be right next to each other. Once we have this set up in Excel, we can go ahead and make our multiple regression analysis. So the settings here are that we have our input Y range, our input X range, we check off labels, we also select an output range. The input Y range is all of this data here through row 21. Then because all of these columns are together, this input X range can be from A1 through C21. Again, the easiest way to do this is to drag and select the data that you want to be inputted into the multiple regression analysis. From there, from this setup, I can click OK, then I get my summary output data. From this set of data, we can then interpret the results. We know we can look at both the p-value as well as the adjusted r-squared value. These both will tell us how good of a fit our data is to this particular multiple regression equation. Now that we have all these coefficients, we can go ahead then and form the multiple regression equation for this particular set of data. So let's do that now. Let's take all these coefficients and make a multiple regression equation from the coefficients. All in one step now, we're also going to plug in the meaning of y hat, x1, x2, and x3. That makes our multiple regression equation as the height of the child is equal to this coefficient here. Then each of these coefficients we plug into the general format of our multiple regression equation. In addition to making sure you label this as y hat initially and only using three sig figs, remember to also pay attention to the sign here of each of these coefficients. So for x1, the height of the father, we have negative 0.336 and so on for the height of the mother as well as the sex of the child. We remember that we use dummy variables for this regression analysis. So remember that the sex is either a zero for a daughter or one for a son. Now that we have that multiple regression equation, we can then solve both parts A and B. Remember that part A was predicting the height of a daughter, part B was predicting the height of a son. Both parts A and B will still use that same multiple regression equation that we just figured out. So for part A, to predict the height of a daughter, we have this height of the father, this height of the mother, and we use zero as our dummy variable for a daughter. Now we do something similar to what we did in 10.2, and we plug in those known numbers into our equation. We know for X1, that's the height of the father, so that's 69 inches. The height of the mother is 63 inches. Then the sex of a daughter we denoted as the dummy variable of zero. That gives us a final answer with three sig figs of 63.2 inches in height for a daughter. Next, for part B of the question, we do the same thing, but we use a dummy variable of one because we wanna know the predicted height of a son rather than a daughter. So what this looks like is, again, we plug in the height of the father, the height of the mother, and then the sex for a son, so that's our dummy variable of one. 
That gives us an answer, again with three sig figs, of 69.4 inches for the predicted height of a sun. Next then, just for some additional interpretation using a multiple regression equation. As a reminder, this was our multiple regression equation. Now we can actually make some more connections here. What we see for that last coefficient for the binary gender is that that coefficient of 6.14, this shows that when given the height of a father and the height of a mother, the sun will have a predicted height that is exactly 6.14 inches taller than the height of a daughter. Why is that again? Well, remember a daughter dummy variable was zero and the son's dummy variable was one. So that's just another interesting connection we can make when we have a multiple regression equation like this using dummy variables. So now that is the end of chapter 10. This also means now that we're at the end of content coverage for our semester. To end off 10.4, I'll make some additional strong recommendations. Remember to complete all my StatLab homework that you can, both past assignments and current assignments. There's no late work penalty for this, so definitely make sure you take advantage of that. Also, you have the opportunity for up to 20 points extra credit. Make sure you do those practice exams that are in my stat lab. Also, make sure you're taking care of yourselves. Make sure you take study breaks, get good rest, stay safe, and remember how close you are to the end of the semester. I hope to see you all in office hours. Feel free to email me or message me or call in whenever you have any questions at all. Let me know if I can help with anything and thank you all for a great semester.